Hi everybody, this is Noelle from Petite Garden Centers. We're here at our Oakwood Village store and we wanted to talk about keystone perennials today. And you know perennials, uh, for us in Northeast Ohio, we consider a perennial plant one that returns in the garden three years or more. So we're in that category of plants here today. And most of the time you'll see these perennials as you know beautiful flowering plants. Um, the keystone part of this is a little bit different. It's more of a um, terminology or concept that was introduced by an ecologist in the 60s. His name was Robert Payne. And keystone plants, animals, organisms kind of glue the habitat together and make for a very healthy environment for wildlife and so forth. So in this respect, in this video, we're gonna talk about some keystone perennials, okay? And so there's actually 10 of them that um, in Northeast Ohio, and I should say in the Eastern Temperate Forest region, okay? Um, and this is in collaboration with National Wildlife Federation. There's also a very famous entomologist, his name is Doug Tallamy, wonderful. Um, and also a pollinator um, ecologist, his name's Jared Fowler. So what, the, what Doug Tallamy and, and Jared Fowler did is they kind of, they researched plant material that really stands as keystone plants that, again, hold the habitat together by their glue, if you will. And so we wanted to show you some of these because they are very common. You will know these plants um, as we go through them. Uh, some of them are a little bit lesser, but the whole idea is that these plants are great for pollinators, especially your butterflies, your, I should say, your butterfly caterpillars, your moth caterpillars, and then of course, as adults, butterflies and moths and then also bees, and then also birds, because of course they benefit from a lot of pollen and also caterpillars and, and those types of things too. So it all kind of works together. So we're just gonna show you general plant families. You choose what you would like the best, but these plants work very, very well, again, to make a healthy habitat um, out there. So the first one that we're gonna show you is coneflower or echinacea. Now, everybody's pretty familiar with coneflowers. Typically, your purple coneflower is your most um, common type is what you see out there. Um, but there are a lot of beautiful colors. I have mentioned several times before that the single cone producing coneflowers like this, this is these that you see here, are orange and red varieties from the Sombrero series, but they are a single coneflower producing that seed cone. So of course, your, your seed feeders are gonna come down, your bird feeders are gonna come down and eat the seed out of there. But we've got a lot of bees around these coneflowers this morning as well. Um, so they, they do appreciate the pollen and the nectar that's in this cone. And then of course, later develop seeds that the birds can eat too. So there you go. You've got one great family, one keystone perennial here, the coneflowers, okay? Um, I do wanna mention that with this, you're gonna see a lot of the composite family. And with composite family of plants, it's a daisy, okay? So uh, daisies attract a lot of different wildlife and um, I should say beneficial wildlife. And um, so you're, you're gonna see a lot of this type of flower that it has the central cone and then also the flare petals coming out from it. So a rays, if you will. So um, let's look for some more. We're by the Hellenium. Hellenium is what we call Helen's flower. Um, common name is also known as sneezeweed. I've, I've mentioned that before. Um, this is not an allergen producer. I just want you to know that. Um, but Helen's flower, Hellenium. And again, you can tell they're just starting to flower. We're in, um, actually we're in the beginning of August here. And a lot of these uh, types of keystone perennials are gonna be 
midsummer into late summer and early fall bloomers for us. And, th and that's good. You want to make sure that you have, um, you know, a wide diversity of plant material in your garden for beneficial wildlife and especially late season. We want to make sure that we have, I should say, I shouldn't say late, but midsummer into fall, we still have a lot of pollen, pollinator plants available for them. So Helen's flower or Helenium is one of those. Again, you can tell it's a composite daisy type flower. The cone in the center has flowers and pollen, real tiny, tiny ones, uh, excuse me, pollen and nectar. And then of course you have the petals on the outside. This variety is called Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is a really good grower for us. Really bright colors, very, very fun. Yellows and oranges on this plant, both. Um, so really nice and upright. And then of course, right behind here, is actually called a Heliopsis. Now, Heliopsis can be false sunflower. They can be known as oxeye daisy. A um, couple different varieties that I have here. This one has a little bit of darker foliage, as you can tell, some burgundy stems, some burgundy coloring. Um, beautiful, again, orange and yellow daisy-like flowers here. So this is summer eclipse. Did I say it right? Yeah, summer eclipse. So this one is here. And then I have one called burning hearts in the back here, a little bit taller. You can tell those yellow oxide daisies. And this one's faded just a bit and the bee is trying to get in there right now when I'm talking about it, but um, they have this red ring around the eye. So they're nice, beautiful. Again, more of that daisy-like flower. It's always gonna be really good for, again, your, your general pollinators, your bees, and also your butterflies. We're here by the Black-Eyed Susans or Rebecca. So again, a, a wonderful daisy-type flower, nice cone in the center rays or petals coming off of that cone. Again, this is a great plant, a keystone plant. So it could be these um, smaller flowering Rubecchia that are really, really great growers in the garden, you know, really reliable as far as returning year after year after year. You could get the larger flower Rubecchia as well um, that sometimes we have to reseed. We have to take that cone, make sure that we're reseeding around the area so they do keep on producing for us. But both both, um, or I should say any of your black eyed Susan families are going to be great keystones. We're getting a lot of pollinator interaction. I don't want to bump too many of the Coreopsis here. There's a load on the red varieties right now and, and yellow and pink as well. So um, folks, if you're looking at Coreopsis again, it is a very reliable perennial daisy, a little bit smaller flowers, no problem, but very profuse typically. And this is one of those those perennials again you once it starts blooming it really does continue to produce buds and blooms and really cycle through the season for us but coreopsis again one of those plants that um, will stay long blooming healthy through the season again we're seeing lots of pollinator activity on it there are several different types and varieties of coreopsis usually we can group them in two categories one is the tick seed type where it's got a very fine ferny foliage to it the other one usually has a thicker foliage taylor i'm just going to have you look over here but that thicker foliage as well you'll see that and it's a little bit more dense looking um, and so that's usually the two categories that you see coreopsis in um, but I'm going to tell you, it, it doesn't matter what color, what flower, um, they all do great. I have Gallardia or Blanket Flower in my hands right now. This is actually one of the Spin Top series. It's called Copper Sun. Beautiful, um, you know, very dark red centers and then beautiful petals coming out. They almost have a tubular petal here. So these are really nice for hummingbirds if they want to come by and get a little bit of a drink of nectar. But again, Gallardia, a uh, native plant, wonderful, wonderful plant. And I, I should have mentioned, and um, with all of these composite or daisy-like flowers, you are attracting a lot of different, um, you know, beneficial wildlife, and uh, they really are wonderful. I'm gonna say, uh, for the most part, they're all full sun plants. 
Um, they probably could take some part shade four to six hours of direct sunlight, but I think they'd really, uh, really prefer to be out in those full sun conditions. So look for those daisies, um, especially colorful daisies seem to really be attracting a lot of the wildlife. And I think you'll have a, a great selection to choose from. And um, there is a perennial sunflower. I know that most of us uh, think about, you know, our large blooming annual sunflowers out in the fields and all those types of things. And that, don't get me wrong, they're an awesome, awesome plant, especially a, a keystone plant too. But there's perennial sunflowers out there available as well. So we have one that's called Autumn Gold and it's absolutely gorgeous. I don't have it um, currently, but Taylor's going to show you a picture and it is a late bloomer. So again, getting some really uh, great keystone plants later in the season, having that flowering later in the season, that's always really good. And one of the best composite families is gonna be asters. Now it's Symphotrichum now is what the botanical name is. And we'll just, we'll just go by asters guys, but asters are gonna be a great composite flower. Again, small but mighty, lots of pollen, lots of nectar, but, and taking you into that late season. So definitely look into asters for that late fall color, but great keystone plant. We're over by evening primrose. Now we've moved out of the composite family and I've, I've literally got two perennials that aren't part of the composite family. Okay, um, which, is, which is great. Again, diversity is really, really good. So different families are wonderful as well. Um, these are evening primrose, or inathra, and um, they, this is a very compact variety, very low growing, sort of mounded, uh, kind of ground cover variety, if you will. This is lemon drop, uh, small yellow flowers, obviously four petals there. Again, lots of nectar, lots of pollen, good for uh, keystone plants. There are several different types of evening primrose. So do look for different varieties out there. Some tall, um, you know, two, three foot tall, some shorter, some larger flowers um, and some that truly open in the evening so you get that fragrance and it's great for evening moss as well. And one final member that I wanted to show you was goldenrod or solidago and goldenrod it gets a bad rap out in the garden everybody calls it ragweed but it is not and it does not have any any association with those um, allergy causing pollens out there so um, do try your goldenrod it is very very good as far as helping beneficial insects and again pollinators butterflies moss bees all of those things that we're talking about today great keystone plant so just remember um, 10 perennials that we showed you today um, a lot of them in the composite or daisy family um, I'm going to say every one of these plants is a sun lover so six or more hours of sunlight um, will do very very well for them um, I also want you to consider well-drained soils. Um, so that's it's a benefit, especially in Northeast Ohio. We have high clay soils, heavy kind of wet soils. And what we're finding is that the summers, these plants are doing great, but if the winter's wet, they don't do well um, because of that clay soil and staying wet all the time. So make sure you're planting them in well-drained areas. Um, of course, check on them and um, you'll, you'll do great with your keystone plants. They are really there to kind of glue together the habitat, make the habitat a little bit more healthy and beneficial for wildlife, especially your caterpillars, butterfly and moth caterpillars, bees, and also birds. Enjoy.